Hello, everyone. Welcome to the March 22nd meeting, 2023 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. Uh, we're a skeleton crew tonight. Um, let me take a look at who's here. Um, so I have a few things to say um, in the first item of the agenda, which is comments from the chair. Um, the first is just we're going to take a short recess tonight from 8 to 8.15. Um, so if you're in the audience um, and we suddenly go silent at 8 to 8, we'll be back by like 8.10 and 8.15. Um, and we have to do that because I need to step away and we won't have a quorum otherwise because <laughs> we're missing three commissioners tonight. Um, the second thing is an update on um, the, what do I call it, delineation uh, appeal, Erin? <laughs> um, do you want to give us an update on Tanbrook? Sure. So, um some folks might be new to the commission because the appeal has been going on for about a year, but um, you folks might remember 52 Faring Street. Uh, it was a delineation for a, an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation where there was a review. We did a, um, a peer review of the delineation and um, it was essentially the order of resource area delineation was a denial because the commission disagreed with the um, the resource area delineation that the applicant submitted and our third party reviewer um, had observed that there were differences in the delineation from what was seen on site. So the commission denied the order and then it went to DEP. There was there was other issues associated with it too, just to be clear, it wasn't just the delineation, there was issues with the watershed um, as well for determining whether Tanbrook was perennial or not. And the commission did determine that at that location, Tanbrook was perennial. Um, the um, order went to appeal with DEP and DEP, um, had some differences of opinion with the commission with regard to some of its decision. And um, and then that decision by DEP, which was called a superseding order of resource area delineation, was appealed by the Amherst Conservation Commission as well as two citizen groups. Um, and since that time, it had been in an appeal process for about a year. And during that time, myself, the town attorney, and the representative for the applicant um, as well as the two parties to the appeal had been in negotiations to try to negotiate a resolution on the matter. And the great news is that we did come to a re resolution and what the resolution was, was essentially that the applicant just withdraw without prejudice the full application, which means that the original decision issued by the commission and the superseding order issued by DEP were stricken from the record essentially and the part of that as part of that agreement there will be two projects one of them which is 46 fairing street which we've been kind of continuing and continuing um, multiple times because of the pending appeal so 46 fairing street which is a single family house lot as well as um, a larger um, housing project which will be off of um, north pleasant street those two projects will basically have the review of the resources um, reviewed based on the project footprint for each of those projects. So those will essentially start from scratch for the review process, but a great success. It didn't go to adjudication. We were able to negotiate through it and come to a solution that everybody was happy with. So um, we are delighted with the outcome and mm -hmm. looking forward to moving forward with the, the applicant on the projects. That's a really big deal. A lot of work has gone into this process. Um, so Erin, thank you for all of the hard work. Um, I think in the end, it's literally the best thing for the resource in question. Um, so great work. Yay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to, that seems like the celebration doesn't fit the scope of, of what we've tried to do, but uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. That's what you did. Yeah. Oh, thumbs up from Andre. There we go. Um, thanks, Aaron. 
Great summary. I forgot some of the steps in there. There are so many. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about, um, did we lose Alex? No, I'm here. Okay. The last yeah, thing I wanted to Alex. talk about was just a check-in on site visits. Um, so it seems like attendance at site visits for hearings um, has been, we've all been struggling and I'm in no place to critique because I just straight up can't get to them. Um, but Aaron and I were talking and given the amount of open hearings we have and given the amount on Aaron's plate, we're hoping that if commissioners have time to attend hearings, if you can emphasize, I mean, attend site visits at all, if you can emphasize attending site visits for hearings, for public hearings, that would be the most appreciated and um, kind of best use of your time so that we have commission eyes on hearing on applications that are going through public hearing processes. Um, and then all the other site visits that Aaron does um, to kind of sort out sites, get eyes on them for the first time, I think we're going to try to let just let Erin do those on her time because her site, her schedule is so full. And if she comes up with something that is unclear or she feels like the commission needs to take a look at, she will then ask us to attend a site visit for that. Um, just because Erin's plate is so full and also all of us are so busy, I feel like if any of us have time to attend site visits, we should attend the visits for the applications for open hearings. Um, so I just wanted to like direct that our energy and effort to that priority, if at all possible. And I know that there are a few hearings coming up um, that are going to be complicated and I will double down on efforts to get out there because um, it just, we need to have somebody with Aaron so that when we're talking about the status of these sites, um, we, everyone kind of can work with an informed opinion particularly for the ones that are coming up related to the issue that I just raised, um, yeah. the ones that are related to the, the Faring Street appeal, it would be extremely helpful if we could get commissioners on the ground. And, and the other thing, just to back that up, is that if commissioners aren't available during the daytime working hours, I can set up site visits in the evenings. It just might mean that I won't be able to be there, um, but I will make time to be there myself. So it just might mean that we might not be there at the same time, but I can arrange to you know, accommodate other people's schedules if need be, if folks can't make it during the day. Um, does that make sense to everyone? The message is just, if you have time for site visits, prioritize the applications that will be public hearings and the rest of them, let's let Erin take a first cut. And if there's something that she needs clarification on or our opinions on, I would like to just trust Erin to kind of bring that to us. Um, and then we can make time to be there for those kind of um, additional site visits. Sounds good to me. Okay, awesome. Thanks everyone. I know it's, it's. I'm anticipating that things will ramp up here, um, especially, given now that we really have no snow. Um, so, and just with the, the applications on the horizon, I think we will need to try to be there and I will also do my best. Um, okay, uh, I, did I have anything else on my agenda? I'm not, I don't think so. Oh, um, oh, last item, sorry. This is a long update, sorry everyone. The um, we, Aaron drafted a letter of support for um, Beth and the DPWs, Beth Wilson and the DPWs um, grant application for replacement of a culvert at, it's Potwine or Pomeroy? Pomer Pomer um, Potwine. Potwine, okay, sorry, they both occasionally um, on Potwine. Um, and I read it and think it's great. Um, I just wanted you guys to know about that. I know Aaron uploaded it in our folder. If anyone has any comments, please let Aaron know. But um, if you have a chance to take a look at that and you don't have any, you know, unless anyone flags anything, Aaron will send that to Beth. I think Beth ideally wanted it by the end of the month, but knowing how these grant proposals go, she probably would appreciate it as soon as possible. And that was the last thing on my 
update list. Um, Aaron, did you want to give a quick update? I know you and Dave have been talking about, oh, director's report. Dave, sorry. Do you have any updates for us? Sure, I can go fairly quickly as I often do. I know you've got a full agenda. Um, yeah, I, I think as Aaron's work ramps up and as, as people become more active in town, so to um, you know, the department, both in planning and, and conservation, you know, things are are going to get busy very quickly, and, and I think they already are. But a couple of uh, just brief updates. One, Aaron and I are working with uh, Nate Malloy, one of our senior planners, um, and other staff on the um, on a notice of intent for the Hickory Ridge Accessible Trail. This is the grant that we got through the state. Um, for the trail uh, to the west of the clubhouse. Um, I, I won't go into detail on it now, but again, we're working on that. And I think Aaron's zeroing in on kind of what that NOI will include. We're under a pretty tight timeline from, from the Commonwealth to get that, get that designed. So, you know, you'll see more coming on that very soon. Uh, speaking of, of notices of intent, we have a meeting tomorrow, Aaron, myself, and Brad and Tyler to talk about, you know, uh, trail projects. Um, our goal, as, as it has been the last summer or two or field season or two, is to really kind of fix what we have as best we can. Um, but there are sections, particularly of the Robert Frost Trail, um, that we're going to be bringing a notice of intent to you for you know, some new uh, bridge sections and bridge and or bog bridge sections. So stay tuned on that. Aaron has some good ideas and is working with Brad and Tyler to kind of guide them uh, toward that process. So there'll be a couple of NOIs coming to you from the department. Um, jumping around town, um, I heard earlier in the season that the folks in North Amherst were going to, again, uh, they were going to resurrect the pancake breakfast, the puffer spawn pancake breakfast. I haven't heard anything recently about that, but I'll see if I can, you know, um, uh, ask around a little bit. It's typically in May or the first weekend in June, so let me see if if that is going to happen this, this year. I hope it does. It's a fundraiser for the department, for staff at Puffer Spawn, for materials and supplies at Puffer Spawn. So that's a good thing. Um, Aaron and I have also been working with the Hitchcock Center. Um, it is salamander and, and amphibian migration time. Um, we're working to try to, we, we pulled together a, a nice group with the Hitchcock Center, our fire department, police department, and DPW. What we're trying to do out on Henry Street is um, make it a little safer, both for salamanders and for people, for families, for researchers. Um, so there's a potential actually tomorrow night into Friday, maybe even Friday for some movement. We don't think it'll be the big, big night, but um, the big night is coming. And our goal here is to try, as I said, make it, make it safer. So we're working with the police department. This year, we may try on one of the nights, maybe more to actually do a road closure and do a detour so that people um, are not interfacing with researchers and families walking on Henry Street. So um, we're working on that. And um, we're going to be using the flashing signals, the solar flashing signals that say a message, you know, message boards that the police often use when, when all of us are maybe going over the speed limit and they say slow down, things like that, um, or detour or road race or whatever. So um, we're going to try to make it a little safer out there because the last couple of years it's gotten a little dicey out there for, for all of our people who are friends to amphibians. So look for some of that. We will have an update on our website, probably going up um, first thing in the morning tomorrow. Um, just these are quick updates. Amethyst Brook Bridge, I did see some new, a new concept for the Amethyst Brook Bridge. Recall this is the bridge that we We've been talking about for a couple of years, no doubt, through the pandemic. Um, our building commissioner, Rob Mora, has been very generous with his time trying to work with us on a safer, better, um, uh, more state and more sustainable design, meaning let's build this thing once and let's not worry about it for 50 or more years. So I think it will require a new NOI coming to you. So stay tuned on that. Um, but I think I think you'll be pleased with the design for the Amethyst Brook Bridge. We do have some of the funding in place for that. I also have some capital money, some CPA money. 
we may work with the Kestrel Trust and others if we need to do some sort of fundraising to make that happen. Obviously, it's Amethyst Brook. Everybody loves Amethyst Brook. I think there would be it would be a good fundraising um, initiative if if we need to go in that in that route that route. Um, let's see. Field staff are working, you know, on getting things going for the spring. Uh, one of the projects there, two of the projects they're working on with the Kestrel Trust. One is recruiting more volunteers uh, to help us out on the trails. So um, if you know folks who want to volunteer out there, you can be in touch with Brad uh, at his email or his um, um, or his phone. I believe there is something on our website about volunteering as well. They'll be focused again on kind of fix it first. So let's fix the Robert Frost Trail. Let's fix those sections of bog bridging that need need repair. Um, and they're also working on um, Chris Valente, who is one of the staff members at uh, um, Kestrel. Um, did I say Hitchcock before? I meant Kestrel if I said Hitchcock. So at Kestrel, um, uh, Chris Valente is an expert on sparrowhawks, on kestrels. So we're going to be repositioning some of our kestrel boxes on town conservation land and trying to do a better job of uh, monitoring and stewarding uh, kestrels and see if we can increase the, uh, the uh, number of pairs we have nesting on town land. Um, let's see. Um, I just wanted to mention that some land um, uh, owned by Coles has come on the market in the last couple of weeks. Um, it is out there. We've been approached by a, a number of folks who live up near Atkins Reservoir. So there's, you know, a, a couple of parcels up near Atkins that are now on the market. Um, Aaron and I have talked about them. We're talking about them with other town staff. I don't want to go into too much detail here, um, actually in public, because it is, you know, um, if we are going to move forward or are interested in those parcels, um, it's better to have those discussions and and or negotiations, um, frankly, in private, um, because they're they are on the market right now. But suffice it to say that we're interested in some of the parcels. Uh, some of them support our watershed um, uh, work at Atkins Reservoir. The Robert Frost Trail goes through some of the parcels, so there's definitely some interest. We only work with willing sellers. We can only pay appraised value of land. So um, if we can't get um, to appraised value um, uh, and, and the, the, the market rate or the asking price is well above that. Um, there's, there's no easy way for a municipality or the Kestrel Trust to bridge that gap. So, um, uh, uh, and the reason for that, just so people know, is that you set really unrealistic and, and unsustainable comps by doing that. So um, suffice it to say, I think we're interested um, we're talking with Cinda Jones uh, about these Coles properties, and we'll see where that goes. Um, obviously, we would come back to you um, and other boards and committees in town if we um, if we uh, get more traction on those parcels. Um, Dave, can you yeah. just remind me? So, does the town have right of first refusal on the properties, or um, most of them? There are properties in North Amherst near Atkins, um, near Bridge Street. Um, many of them are in chapter. So if, um, if there are moves afoot to sell them or develop them, in certain instances, we would have a right of first refusal. Um, that is a very complicated process and uh, not one that most municipalities in Massachusetts have much success with. So I don't really put much faith in the right of first refusal. Um, it, it, it doesn't work out well for land conservation in most cases. But anyway, it, you know, I've, I've, I've successfully used it a couple of times in my career. But anyway, so we'll keep tabs on those properties. And obviously, you know, if we get any traction, we would need to come back to you and some other boards and committees in town and, and see if there was an appetite for, for preserving those in, in some form. Um, Let's see, I think I'll end. Uh, we talked about some of the ADA work at Hickory. Um, the solar project is, is moving forward at Hickory. Aaron has been doing a wonderful job um, meeting with and guiding um, uh, Dynamic, the uh, contractor working for AMP on that project. Um, you know, we, we've talked about some of the benchmarks there. The trees have been felled. 
Um, some of the next work will be improving the access road between West Pomeroy Lane and the Fort River, uh, working on the bridge across the Fort River, and then working on the access roads um, that are already permitted and, and, and well, well designed to get to the Eastern Array and the Western Array. But Aaron is, is meeting with them. I believe we have our next meeting with them. Uh, it is a Zoom meeting next week to go over kind of the next steps. But Aaron has carefully benchmarked uh, what they need to do for each one of those steps. So um, we're feeling pretty good about it. We've got some feedback from people out there walking the land. Uh, we've posted signs about you know upcoming con construction, uh, both on our website as well as out there in the field. So um, I think we should all get ready for that construction to happen in the next three to five weeks. So I think I'll stop there. Suffice it to say, a lot of things happening out there in the field, in addition to wetland filing. So it's going to be a busy spring. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> Commissioners, any questions? Okay, and I guess this is a Dave and Aaron Calabo on the land management subcommittee. Kind of, I know you guys had talked about what the charter for that looks like. Do you want to give us a brief update? Yeah, I'll let Aaron jump in there if that's okay with you, Aaron. Yeah, so um, Dave and I are still working to finalize the land use policy, and it's a very long, very complicated document. There's a lot of comments on it, so. Um, we're doing our best to get through it with a lot of other um, things going on, but in the course of that work happening, um, we basically, we have to create a charge for the committee, and so um, in the board packets, there was um, a draft committee charge that Dave and I have kind of gone through several times to try to essentially create um, a a directive for the land use subcommittee, land management subcommittee, so that we have some guidance as far as what the expectations are, how long the committee would be in place, um, the deliverables of the committee to the board, how the committee would sort of operate in terms of meetings and its functionality. So that is, that's in your folder for your review. We can go through it in more depth if you want. Um, and or if folks want to take a look at it and see if you have comments. I'm thinking that in the coming weeks, we're probably going to be moving towards finalizing the land use policy. And so um, if anybody does have comments on the charge, it would be a great time to um, to talk about those. But if no comments come through in the next few weeks, we're probably just going to be moving forward. Um, I'm I, I got a question. Uh, I got a little confused between the land use committee and the land use policy. So you said you're going to be finalizing the policy. But on the other hand, you're crafting a charter for the committee, subcommittee. And then I got a little lost on comments. Okay. So it sounded like if no more comments come in on the policy, uh, but then I think you were asking for comments on the charter. Can you just kind of tie that together, please? Sure. So you're right. They're two two completely different tracks. The land management policy has been we've been working on for the last year and a half, and that's I got that um, commented on it. Yeah. So that that document has gone through the commission pretty thoroughly with comments and suggestions, and now Dave is making his final pass through. Once Dave has made his final pass through, um, I'll take everybody's comments and incorporate them into the final document. Once it's in its sort of final form, it'll come to the commission um, during a meeting for public comment review and approval. So there will be a sort of official meeting review of that final document in its final format before it's approved. Now, the land management subcommittee it's hey, so a wait a minute before we leave that yeah okay public comment you're talking about public comment during a commission meeting mm -hmm. okay yep and when would the when would the public have a chance to become familiar with it in order to get on and ask a question so once we get the final the final draft that will be for consideration by the board 
what we'll do is post it on the website and it'll be on an on an agenda um and basically the public will be welcomed to you know contribute um comments etc you know make public comments during a meeting on it um and if there's any other final changes those can also be incorporated at that time um but there will be a a review during a public meeting of that now while while we are proposing to do that i just want to make sure that it's clear that the whole intention of that land use policy is for it to be a living document and right. so when and you know sort of in tandem the land the land management subcommittee goes through its process there may be additional changes made to that document based upon you know management recommendations and plans that the subcommittee formulates so it's really just like sort of a starting point for us to have mm -hmm. moving forward yeah could i add something there alex um, just the the document the, the 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 policy document rules and regulations document that that you everyone you know here on the call reviewed and is now kind of on my on my desk it's really a codification of, you know, Aaron really, you know, with fresh eyes kind of said, let's bring everything together because yeah, I, things were all over the place. So it's really, in my mind, it doesn't break any new ground. It really pulls it all together in one place. And we say, okay, this is generally how we've been doing it. We, the town, yeah. the commission. Yeah, I understand. I understand so, that, Dave. You've commented yeah. on that several times. Yeah. I just then, didn't know if there was going to be like a 30 day couple of public comment period where somehow we had to deal with public comments that would come in um, on the draft before it goes final. No, don't, I mean, it doesn't we, sound like you're going to have. Yeah, we could talk about you know, I think having a couple of weeks, you know, having it be posted for, you know, two weeks at least, you know, meeting to meeting would be a a fair amount of time to put it out there and we could you know we could publicize it on our website and and of course you know um Aaron could get that out there so you know if we had it out there for a couple of weeks and then you all vote on it after the the public meeting public here I, I I hesitate to say hearing I'd say more public meeting or public forum on them and then that document is as final as it will get at that moment and then the subcommittee will then look at it as well as some of those topics that are in the charge. And as Aaron said, um, the document may change. The subcommittee may come back to the full commission and say, hey, yeah. we would like to make recommendations to change the dog policy or the dog policy or whatever. Yeah. I understand that, thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay, um, and so with respect to the committee charter, I propose since I know Michelle was one of the main people interested in being on that committee, I propose we send Aaron any specific feedback um, directly offline and we can discuss as a committee on the, as a commission on the next, at the next meeting when hopefully Michelle can be here, if that's all right with everyone. Yep. Okay. Um, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Aaron, for everything. I don't know how you guys keep it all straight. Um, Okay, so I think we are ready for our first hearing. Um, I have our first hearing at 730, but before we kick that off, thanks, Aaron. I just want to read my mind. Um, I just want to go through our general procedure um, for hearings that we find fair for all applicants and everyone involved. And that is um, we shoot for 20 minutes per hearing and Within that, the breakdown is a five minute presentation by an applicant or an applicant's representative, um, five minutes of comments from staff and any like um, site visit photos or updates from the commission, um, five minutes for public comment. And we ask that people identify themselves and their addresses and kind of interest in the project and then um, keep their comments and questions relevant to kind of our jurisdiction on the project and then five minutes for any questions um, and discussion by the Conservation Commission. Um, so with that, um, I should open this first hearing, I believe. And Aaron, would you bring in David Sharkin? I see him. Yes. 
I don't know who the representative for Dandelion Energy is, but let me read the um, yeah. RDA. This public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands, as most recently amended, and Article 3.31's Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. I'm sorry, I cut out there when I uh, joined as a panelist, but um, my name is Hannah Kowalski. I'm from Dandelion Energy. Um, I'm actually in this meeting twice. Uh, the second version of me is for screen sharing. I wasn't sure if you wanted me to share the site plans or if you guys have a copy yourselves. Oh, um, you you should be able to screen share from this. Version. Yeah, it's my um, my desktop doesn't like having the camera oh. on, so I'm logged in on two different devices. Oh. So that's why I'm here twice. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so we'll bring the other version of you in. Oh, it doesn't, oh, look, Aaron, I don't know if I have control over who's in and who's out, Maya. Um, perfect, wow. Great. Thank you for anticipating those logistics. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I've had to do this a couple of times where yeah. technology didn't work with me, so I try and have backups. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so this project, there's actually two different aspects for um, the wetlands determination that we've asked for. The first one is the geothermal project, which is what I'm gonna talk about. And then there's also a storm drain replacement, which I believe David will talk about when we're finished. Um, the geothermal is first. This is just a general diagram, but um, what we're hoping to do here is install a geothermal heat pump. This is a replacement to you know, a combustible furnace uh, to heat and cool your home. The general concept is we drill a hole in the ground. The temperature of the earth is around 55 degrees. Um, in the summer, we can take the heat from the home and put that into the earth. And in the winter, we can take the 55 degree earth and bring that heat into the home. Um, there's a compressor inside of the heat pump furnace uh, in the basement here that can bring the temperature from 55 up to whatever you need it to be to, to heat the whole home. Um, the work that we wanna do, the geothermal wells, unfortunately are within the 200 foot boundary of Puffer's Pond and the 200 foot setback for Mill River. Um, so you can see here, we are at closest 146 feet from Puffer's Pond and 167 feet from Mill River. Um, we are asking for uh, a request for determination to see if we need a wetlands permit to file a notice of intent for these boreholes. Um, in my letter, I mentioned that there are some um, guidances that may allow us to count this as a minimal work product, similar to, uh, you know, a underground line for um, a solar panel array, but ultimately um, it's up to you guys uh, to give you a sense of what we're doing here. Let me see. Um, the drill rig is a standard drill rig, just like you'd see for a groundwater well. The difference is we're going much deeper. We're going around 300 feet. Um, we have a special setup, which is a Kamakio drill rig. You can see here, these are the well casings that we you know, advance into the earth. But at the mouth of the borehole, the Kamakio rig has a diverter. This allows us to have the cuttings, water, soil, rocks, et cetera, um, flow away from the borehole site instead of making a, you know, a mess at the site or needing to do a test pit. Um, the cuttings then flow through a hose to a dumpster that we would position on site. Um, once the dumpster gets close to being filled, what we do is we put a pump in the top of the dumpster. We let it settle a little bit so the you know, thicker stuff gets stuck on the bottom. And then we pump the water out into a silt bag. Um, and that silt bag is allowed to slowly do water over time. When we come back to dig the trench from the uh, geothermal wells to the home, we would then get rid of the sediment in the uh, filter bags. Um, generally, the plan is, the site again, Sorry, too many site figures here. Uh, we have these two boreholes and a small trench going from the boreholes to the property. The trench will be less than four feet in depth um, and it will connect with the foundation of the home. The plan is because of the way the property is sloped to put a silt fence around the lip of the driveway here. Um, fortunately, the sl uh, property slopes away from Puffer's Pond, so I don't anticipate having any runoff towards Puffer's Pond but the concern would be any you know, soil that would escape, any um, 
you know, water that could escape during drilling or trenching would flow into Mill River and the silt fence proposed would prevent that from uh, migrating downstream. Does anyone have any questions so far? Nope. <laughs> this is super thorough. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, I just think uh, Andre has. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I do. Um, oh, sorry, Andre. I couldn't see you. No problem. I can't see me either. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering. Uh, I didn't catch exactly where the water uh, tailings uh, that you're pumping out of the uh, um, out of the dumpster. Where mm -hmm. are they going to end up? So we would most likely put them in the front yard to dewater again, so that the water does not run into either Mill Brook or Puffer's Pond. Um, the silt bags dewater slowly enough that we have not had an issue with them, you know, running far away from uh, where we place them. Basically, they just slowly dewater back into the earth and the ground is able to reabsorb that water. Um, but we can absolutely put down a silt fence if you guys are concerned about that around the area. Um, honestly, I would guess we'd probably put it um, based on this map right here in the front yard. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but the goal for that would be beyond the 200 foot buffer zone. And we can do that with hoses. And, uh, and, and you say that uh, it actually just dewaters at a, uh, uh, at a slow rate or? Um... Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously we'll put the, the bulk of the cuttings in that dumpster. Um, and if the dumpster gets full, that's when we would utilize that, the silt bags. Otherwise, at the end of the day, we're taking that dumpster off site and we'll dispose of the, the soil and, and water or, you know, cuttings uh, off site. All right. Thanks for your answer. No worries. Sorry, I couldn't see you, Andre. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay. Um, David, um, do you want to introduce yourself and give us the overview of the kind of re water drainage reconnect part of this project? Thank you all for your time. David Sharkin here. Um, and I don't know whether there's going to be a Puffer's Pond uh, pancake breakfast, uh, but there's rumors that, uh, that there might be. Uh, what we want to do in addition to the geothermal, which I hope you all approve, uh, if you've been on the site, you know that it's it's really way downhill from the pond, uh, as Hannah said. And Hannah, thank you for all your preparation as well. Um, what we also wanted to do at the same time, there's a storm drain that goes from the basement of my house to the street uh, uh, into the storm uh, sewer. Um, not sewer, sorry, storm drain. Uh, and the pipe is broken. So uh, I've got water backed up into my basement at times. So we're hoping, as you can see, that it would go from the south corner. Um, <laughs> there's already a pipe underneath there that we would uh, have dug up and then reconnect. Uh, we've talked to DPW, the contractor, uh, to uh, coordinate with them to hook up the, the storm drain under this, this mill street there. So that's the other addition we thought better to come to con uh, to you tonight with both of them uh, than separately. Yeah, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, commissioners, any questions, clarifying questions for David? I don't think I see any hands. Okay. Um, Aaron, would you be willing to give us kind of share any site photos and um, give us a rundown from your perspective? Ooh. I can't, you're muted, Aaron. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, so this is standing um, in the driveway with my back to the house looking down. So you can see the slope. Um, this is facing toward the, the waterfall um, and Mill River. So you can see that that's where the area of concern really is. This is, um, if I just turn around, do 180 and facing sort of the house and Puffer's Pond is sort of at the top of that um, slope. And then again, turning and looking toward Puffer's. Um, this is the um, a view of the drain. You can see where the um, 
the roof drain comes down, that's um, the same corner, I believe, where the foundation drain would be coming from. Correct. And then this is turning facing down towards Mill Street. You can see the two um, yellow flags on the trees. These were the trees that were shown for removal on the plan that Hannah shared. And then this is the um, catch basin that the um, work would be tied to. And then this is looking back up the hill. So again, you can see that slope. Um, so my comments generally on the application, so just a couple sort of housekeeping things are that the, the plan that Hannah shared um, shows erosion controls around the foundation drain work, but the plan that was submitted to us does not. Um, so just for housekeeping purposes, if you guys could provide an electronic copy of that plan that shows the erosion controls around the foundation drain. Um, the other thing is that I guess it was unclear to me in the application that water might be coming out of the dumpster. It seemed that the water would be going into the dumpster and taken off site. But if water is to be discharged, we would just need some detail on the filter bag that's being used. And I'm not saying that we hold up approval for those items, but I would definitely like to make receipt of those two items um, a condition of the permit that we issue or of the approval that we issue. Um, I do have some conditions drafted for review. Um, Jen, did you want me to run through these or I don't, it's your call if folks want to read them yourself. Um, I think if folks can read them, they're pretty standard. And the only addition would be just if the applicant could provide the updated site plan showing erosion controls and a detail for the filter for the dewatering from the drilling of the geothermal well. Um, Absolutely. The, the additions. But um, commissioners, if you can just take a couple of seconds or minutes and read through those. Um, let me know if you have any surprises. And in the meantime, I'm just going to open this for public comment quickly. Um, so if you are in attendance um, with a question or comment about the application um, with RGA at 64 Mill Street, please raise your hand. And I will bring you into the meeting to ask a question or make a comment. I'm looking through this list and it looks like they're the rest of the people for the rest of the hearings. Uh, and I don't see any hands raised. Oh, Dave, Dave has his hand raised. Sorry if I didn't see that, Dave. Uh, no, thank you, Jen. I just had a question, too many Daves, Davids. I'll, I'll say Mr. Sharkin for Mr. Sharkin or his team and maybe a clarification from Aaron. I just wanted to, to ask a little bit about the broken drain connection. So I just wanted to, I guess in my mind, confirm. So that is kind of a historic connection, right? That's kind of a grandfathered connection because normally just for the public and for the commission, um, new, new work is not allowed to be connected to the public storm drain system. So I presume this is something that I know you mentioned um, probably meeting with our town engineer, um, Jason Skeels. Uh, could you say a little bit more about that? Am, am I? Uh, it's been there ever since I owned the house in 1986. Mm -hmm. um, that there's always been a, a drain from there that connects underneath um, underneath the road there. So th this is like the French drains around the foundation of the house going yep. into, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And Aaron, that's your understanding as well? Right. So I did speak with Jason Skeels about it. He was familiar with it. He didn't describe it as an illicit discharge. He described it as one that the DPW was aware and familiar with um, mm -hmm. and that he basically had no problem with them being connected to it. But I do agree with you that it's not a practice that we would really generally want to encourage. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure that... Yeah, I was careful to say if it was grandfather because it was right. there before. Exactly. But yeah. it's not something we do today to allow homeowners to connect to that public mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. But it was Correct. it's really it is it appears to be grandfathered because it was there. And I'm sure you can see that discharge pipe in the store in the catch basin on on Mill Street. So I was just clarifying that for you know for my own sake, but also for the commission and and 
anybody in the audience. So thanks. Great. That comes up, it actually comes up a lot with new construction and additions on houses. People want to go, oh, I'm just going to send it all to the street. And um, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're really trying to move away from that with all the, the work the federal government is doing, you know, to um, clean up stormwater um, that we're, we've all been discharging in streams for, for decades. Thanks. Thanks, Dave Zomek. Um, Alex, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, just following along, I um, just the maps aren't on the on the screen right now. You're not sharing them, but it appeared that the run from the drain to the stormwater uh, uh, is a fair distance. And um, I was just curious why there was a need to connect to the drain. Why couldn't, why does, what's the, What's the need? Can the water be absorbed on the site? Meaning like, could they just daylight the pipe and have it stay on site? Yeah, and not, not reconnect to the drain. And then follow up, is this um, new construction? Can, would this be considered new construction? Um, uh, we're, not, we're not constructing anything new. It's a, a drain pipe that's, like I said, has already existed. It's just that it's failing. And, you know, I counted on uh, the professionals that I hired to assess it. Uh, they said it needs to be replaced as it is rather than, um, you know, just, you know, as you said, daylighting it. Yeah. So um, if, if it's no longer the practice, now is a good time to quit. And so my question is, um, if the water can be absorbed um, away from the house, obviously, but the length of distance between um, the, of that pipe from the house to the storm drain is considerable. I mean, it's not like it's just right there. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of ground between the house and the storm pipe, storm drain. Yeah. So, so could it be absorbed around the house? and not have to go to the storm drain and therefore come in compliance with today's rules. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, Aaron, could you pull up the picture that shows the slope between the storm drain daylighting and where the catch basin is on the road? Yeah, that the one thing I did want is there's a couple of comments I just wanted to make on, make on Alex's comment um, and I'll share the photo. Um, so one of the reasons why they may have allowed this back then is because Number one, the slope, it could cause erosion coming down um, towards the road. And the second is if there is substantial water coming out of the pipe, as sometimes happens, and I know he's sort of on the downslope side of Puffer's Pond, so could be receiving some groundwater coming off of Puffer's. And with Mill Street on the downhill side, if there's a daylit situation there, what we've seen in a lot of cases where sump pumps are pumping water out is that it comes out onto sidewalks or into roadways and then freezes in the winter time and causes a public safety issue. So that may be why this was created in the first place. Um, it would be, I'm just, we, we're dealing with a very similar situation on Bay Road with a, a sump pump that is pump, discharging into the roadway. And so I'm guessing that that's why that this, this one was permitted in this situation. So I thought we had two things. We had a drain coming off the roof, and then we had the sump pump um, pushing water uh, out. Other Most of the vast majority of the water is coming all the time because it's coming from the pond. I mean, the ledge uh, from is is right there, so the water literally runs down and under, and then through the house and out again. Um, that, that's the way that it's designed. A nickname for our house is a river runs through it because it, it's pretty, pretty constant, almost, almost 12 months a year. Yeah. So um, what I hear you saying is there isn't enough soil around the house to absorb the water once it's out of the basement. It's a lot of water. Um, and I guess I would have the same concern that Aaron has is that if it's out of the surface and then it might go along the surface and then start eroding into the sidewalk in the street there. Yeah. Uh, I just I mean, thought it's probably cheaper for me, you know, to just put it to daylight rather than pipe it all the way through. But um, that, that, there, I guess that would be my concern. 
Is there another area of the house where the pipe could daylight from the sump pump that um, has the ability to absorb it? Uh, well, it's not a sump pump. It's uh, it's just draining. It's a French drain that just it's constant. So it's uh, gravity. So it's just yes, one around. It's gra it's gravity. I have one around my house. Yeah, yeah. But so I really, also I can't I, I can't really I, reposition it because that's I, where it's going. I thought I heard sump pump in the conversation. It was probably me misspeaking because I wasn't sure <laughs> what it was actually yeah. draining. Well, forgive me for asking, but this is the first time mm -hmm. through this project, um, sure. despite sure. what Aaron sent out. And my first question is, is this something we can avoid um, altogether by, uh, so I didn't understand the background. And that's why I asked Aaron to, to sort of fill me in on why it might have been grandfathered. Could I, Jen? It, it sound hearing all the, the the full picture there of all the groundwater, you know, both coming, you know, from around the house, but also likely from the pond. And then I think Aaron made some good points about, you know, the ero potential erosion of the of the slope. And then the sidewalk is right there. And as she mentioned, we do have some places where groundwater or water from driveways and or other French drains or or uh, sump pumps. In fact, I have that right on my street where uh, we have water draining directly onto the street and it freezes on the winter. I mean, I'm kind of, I asked the question just so we would all better understand it, but I, I think I'm I'm feeling pretty convinced that it it makes sense to keep the the historic connection there. Um, but that that's just my my thoughts. So, Aaron, where does the where does the storm drain empty into? Where does it go? The catch basin in that situation. Yeah. I'm guessing that it probably. I mean, I'd have to look at the DPW utility data, but I'm guessing that it drains down towards the Mill River. Yeah, it does. Yep. Okay. Thank okay. you. For, thanks for the background. Great, good discussion. Um, all right, commissioners, any comments on the um, recommended conditions and with the addition of um, provision of two additional pieces of information from the applicant? Yeah, I, um, it doesn't have anything to do with wetlands, but I'm curious if the stone wall will get reconstructed. Alex, I have to take a recess in three minutes and I just wanna make sure we vote on that. Um, can we go ahead and and get take any comments on the um, co conditions and then come back to the stone wall if there's time? Yeah, sure. Great. Yeah, the stone walls, yes or no question. Oh, it looks like double thumbs up. <laughs> looks yes. like yes, yes, yes. from David Jarkin. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, commissioners, any comments on the um, recommended conditions? No. Looks good to me. Okay, so we're looking for a motion. And you can just reference um, the listed conditions. I move to uh, issue a positive determination under the Wetlands Protection Act under the Town of Amherst uh, General Bylaws. Checking box two in a negative determination under uh, Wetlands Protection Act, uh, checking box three with the noted uh, required conditions uh, that are listed here. Seconded. That's a second from Cameron. Okay, voice vote. Cameron? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm also an aye. Um, David, Hannah, thank you for your time and the great information thank and, and um, explanations. And good luck with the project. Okay. Thank you so thank much. You. Have a great thank night. Thank you for your time all. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night. See you back in what quarter past? Um, yeah, I think we should just break now if that's okay. Um, and I think we can go till 10 past so we can keep things moving if that's all right with you guys. Um, so I'm just gonna like turn off my camera and mute and I'll be back at 10 past eight. Sounds Thanks, good. Thanks everyone. And just so people in the room know, Jen has to take a break for a moment. So we're just taking a, a quick 10 minute recess. We'll be coming right back. Are you going to stop recording? Um, I can't stop the recording because if I do, it won't let me. It'll just end the the complete meeting. Um, so I'll just.
continue recording until um, we reconvene. So, no, nobody will ask us. So, where's the missing tape? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be I'll be here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Erin, I'm going to minimize my screen. Would you just say something when she comes back? Sure. Okay. No problem.
I'm back. Thanks. Hi, Cameron. Uh, hey, Aaron. Um, wondering if we can talk just briefly after um after the meeting. Had a suggestion or a question, actually. Sure. So, uh, do we just stay on or what? Um, whatever you're most comfortable with, um, we could, if you, if you want to ask it not on, on record, we can, um, I can stop the recording and just stay on for a minute and we can talk then. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Aaron, I think I'm going to drop off once we're done with the hearings. Okay. Um, I feel pretty up to date on everything else. And I think I front loaded my comments. So hopefully that's okay. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't, I think the only one item um, might be the UMass relocation of the storm drain okay. outfall. Um, and I don't think that that is a very lengthy thing, but if we were to approve it, um, we would probably need a quorum to do so. Oh, okay, maybe we can do that one first then. Um, all right, Alex, are you back with us? I'm here. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so I think we can thanks everyone for that break. Um, I think we can move forward with our 740 hearing, which is an RDA um, Wetland Wendell services on behalf of Donald, <clears throat> excuse me, and Kathleen Igno. I'm gonna have to ask about that one to determine. I think it's Tiagno. Tiagno, that sounds better. If the work proposed to construct a 16 by 24 studio addition to existing residents at 50 Wildflower Drive is subject to the Wetlands Protection Act and Municipal Wetlands Bylaw. Um, Aaron, if you could bring folks in while I open the hearing. Of course. This public meeting is now being called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131. Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands, as most recently am <clears throat> amended in Article 3.31, wetlands protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Andre? Just, sorry, just a quick uh, clarification. I, I thought that the 740 was on um, 50 Wildflower Drive. What did I say? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Oh, the we second one we we just skipped one is what I'm saying. Uh, we oh skipped, we did. Um, That's okay. There it's oh. it's past oh. seven thirty five, so we can just switch the order of them. I, it's completely fine. But I'm thank you sorry. for pointing out that we thanks Andre. Mm -hmm. No problem. Sorry about that. Um, I think these will both. I mean, I'm sure there are things to discuss, but sorry for the swap, everyone. My bad. Um, okay, Ward. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Will you be giving us a project overview? Yes. Can, okay. Aaron, can Aaron screen share um, the copy of the plan? Yes. Um, um, let me just get to the, you just sent me the update. So let me just pull that one up and pair with me. Got it. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So the project is for the construction of a studio addition within the buffer zone to an intermittent stream. Um, it's was part uh, constructed as part of um, the subdivision way back in the day, Amherst Woods. It says drainage easement up there. There's a uh, an intermittent stream with rip wrap banks, um, and you can see the wetland flags A1, A7. It leaves a concrete headwall, and 
most of the area between the stream and the proposed addition is lawn and relatively flat. Um, I was unaware of your new bylaw um, requirement that you uh, mitigate any impact over 20% within the buffer zone. So we're proposing a planting area of 500 square feet at the edge of the lawn that's shown on the site plan here. And we're proposing to plant 20 shrubs in that area, um, highbush blueberry, aronia, shadbush, and winterberry holly. Um, most of the work is gonna be ac accessed from the existing driveway at the bottom of your plan. That's where the concrete trucks would come in, but um, like to have potential access if we need it from Fox Glove Lane. So that's why we've put the silt fence um, with silt sock uh, to give enough room for machinery if we need to access from Fox Glove Lane. The other thing that we discussed at the site visit was to have a small area of um, Topsoil stockpiled, which is shown to the right where you see the studio addition, which will be covered with a tarp. Um, just topsoil, any other material is going to be uh, sand and gravel will be removed from the site. So we're we're not any closer to the intermittent stream than the existing single family home. Uh, we're outside of the 50 foot. With the work, the construction activity will be within potentially within 50 feet on the lawn, and any disturbance to the lawn will be restored to lawn. Other than that, um, mitigation planting at the edge of the lawn near the intermittent stream. Okay, it's a great overview. Thanks, Ward. Um, commissioners, do you have any clarifying questions quickly before Erin gives us her rundown? Looks good. Okay, Aaron, would you be willing to share any site photos? Yeah, that's the area right there where the studio addition will be right in there, yeah. And that's the one. Aaron, Aaron, you're muted. Very sorry. <laughs> uh, that, was a good, that was a good collaboration though. Was yeah, it? I'm like talking and it was like words and voice coming out of my mouth. Um, yeah, so this is the area of uh, the sort of restoration where the plantings would be. There's already a natural tree line there. Um, so it would be nice to um, put the plantings in and reduce the lawn a little bit along the edge of the intermittent stream to compensate for the additional um, structure area. This is a, another view of the. Um, you can't you can't actually really even see the the um, swale from this view, but it drops down right behind this tree line with the where you see that mature tree and these um, rhododendrons. It's right behind that. And then this is looking out towards Foxglove, and then back to the um, swale, looking toward the house. Um, I did talk with Jason Skeels briefly about this and the homeowner. Um, I think that there is some um, suggestion that this was actually constructed as a stormwater conveyance back in the early 80s to capture stormwater and direct it away from the homes. Um, but even though it was constructed as such with you know, riprap armoring, there is flow in the stream. So it still does meet the um, definition of an intermittent stream. Yeah, I didn't follow it upstream, but if you could go back one photo, Aaron, if you can, um, down where you see the culvert where the stream leaves the site, there's a little bit of a fringe of a bordering vegetated wetland down there, jewelweed and stuff. And I'm sure if you follow the stream up, you're going to find little patches of BBW, which would make this uh, jurisdictional as an intermittent stream, even though it probably was man-made. Um, given, given that, I think this is certainly meeting our requirements of the bylaws kind of as proposed. Um, and can you go through the plantings list again? And they were yeah. all natives, I think. Yeah, it, it's all natives, uh, all natives. So it would be shadbush, highbush blueberry, winterberry holly, and aronia chokeberry. Got it. Okay. 
So 20 of those, and um, I think the applicant is going to, it's not going to be like a line. They're going to fit them in where there's, because there's rhododendrons in some places and other things. So it's it's not going to be like a, a perfect strip, but they're going to plant them, you know, where it makes sense. Okay. That sounds great to me. Aaron, did you have any more info? So Ward, um, it's total, a total of 20 and it'll be a mixture of the three yes. varieties. Yes. And um, if we could just make sure that the, the plantings are, um, you know, decent size plantings and not just sort of seedlings, but maybe like a, um, mm -hmm. a 12 inch pot per, um, mm -hmm. per planting, that would be preferred yes. just to ensure its success. Um, I have drafted orders of conditions in the project folder for this one, um, the standard boilerplate for residential projects, as well as um, just some site specific um, uh, conditions. I know that um, I, I'll open it up so that folks can have a quick look at what the um, special conditions are. The standard are just our boilerplate for residential projects, which are pretty standard, um, like pre-construction meeting stuff, not crossing the um, wetland with equipment and that type of um, condition. If folks want to just read it while you do public comment, similar to what we did previously, Jen. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Okay. Commissioners, if you could run through this, I don't think there will be any surprises. Um, that would be great. And in the meantime... I will double check um, if anyone in the, any members of the public in the audience have questions or comments about what was our 740 RDA. Um, and that is a studio addition to existing residents at 50 Wildflower Drive. If you could raise your hand. Not seeing anything. Last so call, 50 Wildflower Drive. Questions, comments? No hands. Um, Aaron, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, the only the only condition that I was a little bit um, sort of unsure about in this particular case, just because it's it's a lawn right down to, you know, this small native strip where they're already putting plantings in um you know generally when we do a restoration area we'll have some sort of requirement for boulders as a sort of you know restriction for for mowing um i am a little hesitant in this case just because of the size of the yard and also because um you know if they chose to plant more or expand that strip that it's um you know the boulders might be restrictive there in terms of um, the wetland itself, because um, it's you know so close to the to the swale. Uh, so I guess I would just defer to commissioners whether you think there should be some sort of a permanent demarcation or boulder um, or fence line or something put there to protect the plantings. Um, but that was kind of that's the only one that I was a little unsure about. Yeah. So my um opinion on this is I think a border is is overkill in this case for the reasons Aaron mentioned but also it might be more disruptive to put boulders or a fence in <laughs> than um just the plantings I mean if we're talking about 12 inch pots those can be hand kind of dug and installed and putting in boulders would require some equipment to run back there um so that's my read on this site, but I'm open to what commissioners, if any commissioners have strong opinions on this, love to hear it. Not seeing anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't see a need for it uh, with with such a short um, distance. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Andre. All right. Well, um, Commissioner, does anyone have any comments on the conditions or any final questions? Um, otherwise, I'm Aaron, if you would share the your PowerPoint so we can make a motion. Um, I move to issue a positive determination under Wetlands Protection Act under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws 
checking box five and a negative determination under the Wetlands Protection Act, checking box three with the noted required conditions. Um, and just sorry, just to clarify quickly um, for the applicants, a negative determination when it's a request for determination is um, good. It means that we're not asking for a full, for um, submittal of a full notice of intent application. Um, so just to clarify that, that can be a little misleading. Um, okay, sorry, commissioners, we're looking for a second. Second. Second from Alex, voice vote, Cameron. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right, Tiagnos, sorry I butchered your name. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Ward, thank you. Have a good night. And Ward is staying on, I believe, yeah. for, oh. the, um, thank you. I'm for the next one as well. Hope. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I'll get the right hearing this time. Um, Aaron, will you um, bring in the applicants and yes. applicants representatives while I... So this is our 735 RDA. Um, Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Marvin and Donna Spence to determine if the work proposed to install a water line service to existing residents at 597 East Leverett Road is subject to WPA uh, Municipal Wetlands Bylaw. This meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Um, so I see wards here were the Spences planning to join. No. Okay. They're down in Rhode Island. Okay. So, and they're not particularly tech savvy. So. Okay. Okay. Oh, All good. Okay. So they've got an existing well that apparently has a lot of iron in it. It's not particularly good, which I know is a problem. Uh, we have the same thing where at my house, we have a distiller that we drink distilled water because there's so much iron and manganese in the water. So what they'd like to do is to um, run a one inch water line from the existing water main on East Leverett Road to the existing single family home through the existing lawn on the property. And the, they, in order to do that, they, they're proposing to do a trench um, two feet in width and four feet deep to get below the frost line. Um, as you're looking at the plan to the right, you've got a, a shrub swamp bordering vegetated wetland that extends into the lawn based on hydric soils. And to the left is the, I've driven by this since the eighties and that, that pond you can see from the road there, that's an obvious man-made pond, um, which may, Aaron and I were talking about, I don't think maybe it doesn't have an outlet. So the water level fluctuates greatly in it, but um, the proposal would be to have sediment and erosion control to the right of the trench before it crosses the driveway and to the left of the trench or north of the trench after it crosses the driveway based on the slopes to protect the wetlands to the south and the pond and the BBW to the north. Um, the, the big issue that we discussed, well, there may be other issues, but one of the issues was um, the water table is fairly high and there were a few pits that were dug to make sure that the proposed uh, route was not going to hit bedrock. And as we observed the other day when we were on the site, the water table is about two feet down um, in the lawn area. So we discussed conducting the work when the when the when the ground when the conditions are dry. Um, so I told um, Marvin Spence that, which you know, he's ready to, he was ready to have it done yesterday, but um, he understands that um, it makes sense to wait. And otherwise then we're gonna have to do some kind of a dewatering plan. And I, you know, this, if we just wait till the water table is down below four feet, um, then we don't really have to worry about that. His contractor said the work would be done in a day or a day and a half at the most. So basically it's just, this is looking right at where the water line would come from. Um, you can see the test, one of the test pits at the bottom of the photo and one of the test bits, yeah, right there. So that's where the water line would go. The erosion control would be to the left in this photo. That's looking at the shrub, uh, shrub swamp wetland. 
And I don't know if you can see the flags on that one. I don't know if you could see the flags where it comes into the lawn, but it does come into the lawn. I can't, I don't see the flags, but they're right oh, there. Oh yeah, there. I did see pin flags in the lawn yeah, a little there bit. Are pin there. You can kind of see where the wetland is just based on the, the change in the color of the vegetation there. So that area had hydric soil. So I flagged that in as, as wetland. Um, Oops, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Facing the house. Yep, and there's the more, te more test pits crossing the driveway and then going up to the house. There's the pond. Yeah, and so just, I didn't have any problem with um, what's proposed. I did put some conditions in the, um, uh, in the motion similar to the last where, you know, suggesting that the water table be low or that if they do hit groundwater that we have to come up with a dewatering plan before they can pump it. Mm -hmm. And also because yeah. of the proximity to an HESP area that they should be doing just a quick sweep of the construction area and make sure they don't have any um, wildlife in the area before um, construction. But I think that's something that the contractor could do. Yeah, the area the area is kind of um, excluded from the uh, natural heritage and endangered species area. Uh, but as Erin and I discussed, the species that's probably in the area, it's possible they could use that pond, even though that area is not mapped. Um, so it makes sense to have the contractor aware of that. I believe if that's the pond, I think it is. My daughter and I always stop there to see baby geese. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, Alex, you probably have a serious question or comment. No, it's um, more of a construction comment and kind of outside our jurisdiction, but uh, to protect uh, water lines from frost, um, consider putting firm uh, insulation board over the top. Um, okay, I, I was will. Told, I was told last night that that has been adopted as, as code for um, houses. I don't, I didn't yeah. check it, but a friend of mine who's a contractor told me that around a campfire. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've used it at my own cabin where I want to uh, minimize depth of to uh, frost. And I just put in two, two I think it's two inch firm insul uh, foiled insulation. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, tell the applicant that because it's possible um, if he hits area where he can't go below four feet, that that would make sense to use that. Yeah, and I, the contractor can probably talk to him about it and uh, yeah, it works. There's even a relationship between inches of foam and uh, reduced depth to frost. That's all I had, thank you. Thanks, Alec. All right, commissioners, any Further questions or comments? Otherwise, we're looking for a motion. Jen, we should probably just check if there's oh, any public, public comment. comment. Sorry. Commissioners, read the proposed uh, <laughs> conditions, and I'll check for public comment. Thanks, Aaron. If you're um, a member of the public in attendance for this RDA for 597 East Leverett Road, if you could raise your hand. Any questions or comments? Last call, questions or comments on RDA for 597 East Levert Road? Not seeing anything. Commissioners, any final comments or questions? Otherwise, a motion? I can do that. Okay, thanks, Alex. Um, I move that, uh, move to issue a positive determination under wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws checking box five and a negative determination under wetlands protection act checking box three with the noted required conditions. Seconded. Seconded by Cameron, voice vote Cameron. Aye. Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I'm also an aye. Thanks Ward. Thank you very much. Have a good night. You too.
Good luck to them. All right, let's see if I can get the next hearing right. We've done 740. Oh, so did I? Um, so this one's just a continuation. We're just continuing this to the next meeting. Okay, yep. we just made a, a motion to continue the um, NOI for um, 47 Fearing Street. A second. Oh, I need the motion. Sorry. I thought you just gave one. Yeah, I move to continue a public hearing to 4-12-23 at uh, 7.30. And this is the hearing for the SWCA for 52 Fearing Street. Seconded. Just to correct, that's for 46 Fearing Street. It's 52 Fearing Street LLC, just for the record. Uh, 52 Fearing Street LLC at 46 Fearing Street. Thanks, Andre. Okay, voice vote, Alex. Aye. Andre? Aye. Cameron? Aye. Okay. Um, uh oh, what happened? What's next? So I think um, uh -oh. the last one is um, 21. Um, 21 East Hadley Road. Okay. Yeah. And this should it. be a relatively straightforward one, forward one as well. I just promoted um, Steve Veano to the okay the panel um and this is uh, this is our first time we were going to talk about it last week but we didn't last two weeks last meeting but we didn't right correct yep so let me open this too um so this is the rda um for in green garden sink on behalf of stephen and stacy gordon over at 21 east hadley road this public meeting is now called to order this meeting is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131 section 40 of the general laws of the commonwealth an act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of amherst general bylaws hi steve how's it going everybody good um so if you would give us a quick introduction of yourself and overview of the project yep Definitely. So um, my name is Steve Viano, and um, I am uh, here on behalf of um, of the homeowners of 21 East Hadley Road, Steve and Stacey Gordon. And um, so what we're looking to do is I was here about in, uh, I believe, June was the last time that I that I uh, submitted a WPA. And um, that was to do initial clearing at the property to um, to remove a, um, a large overgrown area on the left hand side of 21 East Hadley Road. Um, and then since it was uh, the everything, all the uh, brush was removed, we stabilized the area. And then it, now what, and then uh, we also proposed during that meeting um, future work that would then um, allow us to go ahead and, uh, and replant the area um, at the property. Um, the, the homeowner, they're a longtime Amherst resident, and um, they've came into this property now and um, they did uh, major renovations inside of the house. And now they're looking towards the outside landscape of the property. And um, in doing so, what they're looking to do is um, be able to um, to enhance the uh, the landscape around their around their house. And um, with that being said, um, there's there's a lot of planting that uh, that is proposed that we'd like to do. And um, what we would like to do in addition to the planting is we would like to do some hardscaping. Um, and it, what we're hoping to do in terms of a timeline on the project is um, once we get approval, we, we or yeah, once we once we get approval, we would like to um, to be able to um, get started as soon as possible and uh, be able to restabilize the air or do what we have to do and then restabilize the area um, by Memorial Day is when we'd like to have everything planted and, and done and all set. Um, so looking at the property right here that Aaron just pulled up, what we would like to do. So there's a, if you're looking at the back left of the, of the main residence, um, there is a Goshen stone patio that was present with the, uh, with the original home. So what we'd like to do with that is um, we want to resurface that patio. And um, if we, uh, once we, um, look at the top layer of it um, to, to put new base in. Um, if that patio does need um, a little bit more help base wise, we'll, we'll stabilize it correctly and put proper base material in. Um, then going around towards the front of the house, um, there will be a, a short little, uh, little wall just to make a, a small planting bed in front of the house and, um, and some steps that, that then uh, go up to their new addition that they had put on the house, which they applied for a permit for through the builder. That was a, uh, that was a while ago now though. Um, and then 
to the right of that, there's um, Goshen Stone Wall that was present that uh, that that did that was falling apart. And uh, what we'd like to do is reconstruct that wall and then also extend it um, approximately 10 feet just to wrap around to uh, a portion of the front of the house. Um, over there, we want to end the wall into a couple of large boulders um, just for aesthetic purposes. And then um, we'll talk about the planting plans for a little um, in the in the next picture that we bring up. Um, so um, this is one of our bigger questions is uh, with the driveway. So the current driveway is a uh, is an asphalt circle um, that then leads all the way out to the roadway. And um, what we would like to do is uh, make that circle a little bit smaller. So it's about 60 feet wide um, at the widest point between the front of the garage and the front door of the house. So we're gonna shrink that down to, um, to 50 feet um, and then have a, a direct access right into the garage for the homeowner. So we'd get rid of the circular portion of it. And, um, and it's currently an asphalt driveway. So what we wanna do is um, put a permeable driveway back in so um, with that being a permeable driveway, we want to construct it out of um, a cobblestone border and then have the infill of that driveway with, um, with pea gravel or a or similar round stone that's about uh, three quarters of an inch. And um, we want to, so the, where the garage is, so there's a line that just makes it a little bit bigger, but though that's nothing that... Uh, that was just um, the rendering had it had it off a little bit when we did the first rendering. So um, so so that's just to account for the actual size of the garage. Um, and then we want to just expand a little parking area right to the side of the garage. And then the main question that we had as well was um, to be able to move the driveway over to um, where the original driveway was. You can see where the the silt sock lines are. Um, where the where the current entrance is, we would like to move the driveway to the other side of the tree. Um, so then it could follow along um, the other trees of the driveway to make more of a grand entrance into the property. Um, with that being said, um, we would make sure that we are uh, we're away from the from the drip lines of all the trees, and uh, we staked everything out to uh, on the property just to kind of get a little bit of a feel for um, for what that would look like. And uh, we think it also makes a, an easier entrance into the uh, into the property since it is. The second house in from a main road, um, you get a little bit better better visibility um, coming around the bend as you uh, as you come from the um, from the main road over there, which is West Street. Um, what else? So that okay, so that's that. Um, then what I did was uh, we made a base map for the planting zone. So we want to put a lot a lot of plantings in for the property. So the best way for uh, me to be able to describe it was uh, was breaking it away into zones. So zone five, I wanted to start with. So that's on the left-hand side of this map. Zone five, so to the left of zone five is where the wetlands are, or there's actually wetlands on both sides of the property, but the zone five is, is standing water wetlands. And then on the other side of the property is the, um, the Mill River or the Fort River. But the the so Fort River, one. yeah. Fort River, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so then this, what we want to do uh, in zone five is reestablish a wetlands border. Uh, we want to do that by, um, by establishing multiple different sizes and varieties of birch trees, um, just to, uh, for aesthetic purposes. And then also to um, install some red twig dogwood and um, on the edges of the property, some other, some other native shrubs. Then um, going to zone four, that's the, um, that area is where we removed uh, shrubbery um, that was presently there that was overgrown. So in zone four, that is what we want to do is a uh, an evergreen windbreak, all native evergreens, and then um, zone three A and B. So that's the driveway plantings or the entranceway plantings. So in zone three B, there is um, two large maple trees there already. So um, I don't imagine us doing doing too much in terms of planting underneath them besides maybe some small shrubbery that's shade tolerant such as some rhododendrons. Um, then on zone 3A, that's our, um, our driveway entrance uh, or our house side of the driveway. Um, that side, we want to do mostly lower shrubs, things like inkberry, uh, blueberry, winterberry, um, things in the ilex and the holly family that give us some uh, evergreen foliage as well as um, giving us uh, giving us aesthetic appeal to the property. Zone two is the um, is the is the street view of the house, uh, the planting side, at least. 
And um, in that area, that's also uh, shrubbering some smaller trees just because it's, it's closer to the house. And um, that's also said with zone one and zone six. Uh, zone six, we're gonna establish a, uh, a gradient into the, to the wood line using shrubbery as well. Um, and then I think that's pretty much the overview of all of that. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. It was very thorough. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> um, all right, Aaron, <laughs> or commissioners, any clarifying questions for Steve? Well, that's all fresh. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Um, forgive me, uh, I'm having to go back. And would you remind me again, I know where the wetlands are on the left, and you said that they're open water. Where is it on the right? So on the right, that would be the um, the Fort River that's across the street. I just couldn't see it on the drawing, but I and I haven't driven by it, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just a, within two hundred feet of riverfront. Yep, yeah, okay. the from the front of the house to the uh, to the edge of the river, it's about one hundred and twenty ish feet. When I uh, when I checked it on GIS last. Yeah. So would these plantings be? Um, Mulched in between, mowed in between, uh, grass. Yep. So, um, so in the front area of the property, um, to the right hand side of the driveway, um, that is, uh, we would like to do mulch in, in all the planting beds, and then we'll have a, a lawn in the so where that snow is right there. So, all that will be lawn space leading up towards the house until we, we reach the, the house planting areas. Um, then everything on the left hand side of the um. There we go. Um, on that side of the property. So as you get deeper, so right where that hemlock is, there will be a little bit of grass over there. But the, besides that, what we'd like to do is um, on the left hand side of the property, we'll keep a um, we'll keep uh, keep mulch in, in the beds there. And then another thing I forgot to mention as well is off of the back of the property. So behind where that hemlock is probably about 50 feet. That's where the wetlands where the left or the, what we were mentioning, the left-hand uh, wetlands are. Um, we do want to reseed the bank of those wetlands as well with the uh, same native mix that we used when we uh, when we did our first work uh, near the wetlands as well. Thank you. Do you want to just give us the run through of these photos, Aaron? I think I followed yeah. with them. Yeah, I mean, we're pretty familiar with this site at this point because this is, I think, the third RDA we've seen, but... Um, uh, front of the lot facing um, East Hadley Road from the driveway, um, turning towards facing the house. Um, this is looking back toward the wetland. Um, the, the hemlock there is about 50 feet from the wetland in the back. Um, this is looking um, back at the area where there was a huge stand of bamboo which had been removed very sort of invasive in the wetlands back there so they pulled the bamboo out um, a couple of my recommendations and the conditions were to pull the um, filter sock back out of the wetland now that the um, bamboo has been pulled out um, and then this is the area of the wetland that would be reseeded that steve was mentioning um, this is looking sort of up the, the wetland line towards the neighboring property. There's some beautiful old willow trees in the back there. Um, and then this is looking toward where the, um, the other direction towards the other property owner's house. Um, from my perspective, I think that um, the plantings are going to really enhance the buffer zone for this property um, tremendously and give a lot of habitat value. It seems like they've been very thoughtful about um, providing native species that provide habitat value in terms of like berries and, um, uh, you know, areas for nesting, areas for shelter and cover. So I think that there's there are a lot of benefits to the planting plan that they've proposed. Um, I did mention that in the back where they're doing the plantings um, facing the wetland area that those areas shouldn't be um, mowed, you know, that they should be sort of left in a in a natural condition in the back. Um, I do think that the existing conditions on the permit are fine um, from the the order of conditions that was issued previously. So I would just recommend that we apply the same conditions to this permit, um, which I did include in the um, OneDrive folder. Um, 
Yeah. The only thing I would add is just, I think I appreciate the timeline because I think getting this planted and stabilized sooner rather than later is wise. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a lot of dirt out there right now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, yeah, thanks, Aaron. So commissioners, if you want to take a look at those existing kind of outstanding conditions, um, from all the other active determinations and, um, make sure you don't have any questions or comments. I'll just open this for public comment quickly. Um, if you are a member of the public and you have a comment or question about this RDA um, for 21 East Hadley Road, please raise your hand. I think the two people that are currently still in the meeting are for the UMass discussion after this hearing. So I don't think we're gonna have any comments. Last call. No hands raised. Commissioners, any? Final questions or comments? No? Okay, then I'm looking for a motion. Um, I move to issue a positive determination of applicability checking box number five and a negative determination of applicability checking box two, but with noted conditions. Second it. Second from Andre, voice vote Andre. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Alex. Aye. I'm also an aye. Thanks for all the prep work. Great overview, Steve. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck with your work out there. Thanks for your patience, Steve. I know we uh, didn't have time to get to it last time. No, no problem. Thank you. I appreciate uh, appreciate all of you guys. Okay. Good luck. I hope there's the right amount of rain this spring. Yep. (laughs) All right. So um, the two folks from UMass are here, and I know, yeah. um, Jen, if you want to take care of that and table the other items, that's completely fine. Yep, that would be great. Okay. Um, I just, I just, let's see, I'm up to panelist. Okay, I see Brittany. Um, so commissioners under other business, um, this is about um, we permitted a UMass Lincoln Ave apartments, and um, it sounds like the engineers want to relocate the stormwater outfall to a swale over kind of on the other side of campus. Um, so I'll let Brittany and Jared run us through that. Hey, let me let me share my screen. And this would be a minor administrative change, Erin, are we saying, to the existing order of conditions? Okay. Correct. Yeah. So that's what we're evaluating commissioners as whether this is a minor administrative change to existing conditions or the existing order of conditions. Yeah, so we, we went through the NOI process with you guys in December 2021, I believe, so quite a while ago. So just as a quick refresher, um, we have proposed um, dormitory building here and here on the site. And then we have a parking lot here, which is adjacent to the Tan Brook right here. And so we're proposing some new drainage within the buffer to the Tan Brook. And our original plan was to reuse an existing outfall that goes to the Tan Brook. And that is right here in orange. Um, And then we proposed an alternative because we needed to do a video inspection of that pipe to make sure that it was in good condition. And if we found that it wasn't in good condition, we were going to replace the outfall um, as shown in blue here, and then include some hand placed stone at that new outfall location and the erosion control. And if this was the, the way we ended up determining that we needed to proceed, it was going to be an administrative change um, and we would issue a formal drawing for it. So we did that video inspection and determined that that pipe was not able to be reused. It was crushed. Um, And so we've been looking for alternatives, including replacing it. And just to quickly run through that drainage pattern again. So that existing outfall comes to the Tan Brook in light blue here, and then the Tan Brook flows to the north and through a 60 inch culvert. 
the culvert is, or it already was, it was approved to be relocated a little bit so that we could construct the building. And so what we're proposing now is this, this drainage that's highlighted in orange is what was previously going to be draining to the Tan Brook. And this drainage that's highlighted in yellow is what was previously going to be connecting directly into the 60 inch culvert. So what we would like to do is rearrange our drainage system essentially so that what's shown in orange is now going to come this way and also connect to the north directly into that 60 inch culvert. So this wouldn't be any additional work within the buffer. Any, any change in work that we're proposing would really be outside of that, that buffer line, maybe a little bit in here, but not any, not any areas that aren't already being disturbed. So we're not proposing any new disturbance and we are changing where the water is draining to, but the Tanbrook does ultimately discharge into that 60 inch culvert. So we don't anticipate any drainage issues with that. So really we see this as a benefit to not have to replace this outfall and to eliminate it. So we want to abandon that in place and instead connect this way. So I think we're looking for feedback from the commission if this can be made in administrative approval or if you need us to come back through the commission. That was a great overview. Thanks, Brittany. I feel pretty clear on the plan. Um, Aaron, do you have anything, any site visit photos or anything? Um, I don't have site visit photos to share. Um, I can actually try to track some down for you really quickly while we're talking. That's okay. Not necessary. Um, I remember exactly what that outfall looked like. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think this is an improvement. Um, I know this is an improvement. <laughs> will, um, Brittany, will the outfall be like existing kind of futurely, future defunct stormwater outfall to Tanbrook? Is there any way to like, will that be decommissioned or like um, is there anything we can do to make sure it's clear that that's not functioning and shouldn't have water flowing into it and prevent like kind of any scour or erosion at that location on Tanbrook? Um, yeah, so we, I, we, I don't think that we were proposing to do anything within the Tanbrook for that out, outfall. We would um, cut and cap it on site though. Okay. Okay. Andreas, you have a question. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, uh, Brittany, I'm wondering if uh, uh, what, how you're going to uh, join the that current outflow uh, piping, if you would, within the uh, or near the structure to the other uh, uh, yellow portion, if you would, um, how you're going to connect that, and uh, how much of that is within the uh, uh, buffer zone? Yeah, so the buffer. Let me highlight the buffer real. Real quick. You're so not the, sharing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. You, Aaron was you just showing us the. the um, yeah. <laughs> um, let me share my screen again. Well, while Brittany's pulling that up, I just wanted to say I one of my thoughts was to remove the pipe or to stabilize it. But looking at the photos, I see, and probably the reason it's failed is there's a large tree that's growing right over the top of it. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we don't want to rip that out and like further destabilize the bank. Right. right. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. Back to Andre's question. <laughs> yeah. So th this red here is that buffer. And then you can see the parking, the parking lot extends this way. So the work that we're proposing would all take place within the parking lot, essentially, um, within the buffer. So we we haven't quite determined the routing that we're going to take yet. We're working with the contractor to determine the best way to do that based on their procurement of materials. Um, so that that is still in flux, but essentially we would be taking all of this in orange and bringing it this way. And then whether we connect directly to the yellow here or if we run a line parallel to it and make the connection up somewhere closer up here, we haven't determined that yet. We just know that 
we want to keep the work out of this area because we have existing trees that we are maintaining. So that, that work is really going to be coming to the west and then the north. So no additional impacts within the buffer and likely less impact. Correct. Within the buffer. Yes, no additional impacts within the buffer. Did you have any follow-up, Andre? Is that... No, you've uh, you answered uh, my question. I suppose if it's going through the uh, parking lot area, it, it's not going to make a much, much of a difference uh, there either. Um, okay, uh, I, thanks for your uh, for your answer, Brittany. No problem. All right. Um, yeah, I think this fits squarely under a minor administrative change to the existing order of conditions on the existing permit. Um, I'm comfortable with that. I think commissioners, unless anyone has any last concerns or questions, I think we would be looking for a motion to um, improve a minor administrative change for the UMass Lincoln Ave apartments um, involving relocating the stormwater outfall into Tanbrook. And you can say so moved. So moved. Second move. All right. Voice vote. Andre. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm also an aye. All right. That's it. Brittany, Jared, thanks for hanging on for the long meeting. Mm -hmm. um, good luck. Thank you I'm very glad much. you're not Have using that out, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> we are too. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Have you. a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Erin, is it really okay if we table? We... Yeah, absolutely. Nothing else on the um, agenda is urgent. So um, it, okay. I, that is completely fine. Actually, it'll give you guys a chance to have a look over the draft memorandum of understanding. Um, we already talked about the grant um, and the Amherst Hills Tofino project is, I have not been out there yet. So um, that'll be pending to hopefully the next meeting. Okay. Thanks everyone. I think we just Thanks, need a, mo a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Second. A voice vote. Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Cameron. Aye. I'm an aye. Unanimous. All right. See, so you, guys, see you guys in April. All, All right. right. Sounds good. Great. Have a Bye. good night. Aaron, you gonna stay on for a sec? I will. Yeah. All I'm right. just gonna okay. stop the recording. Mm -hmm. Andre, is, is this a personal conversation? Do you mind if I stay on? Uh, not at all. Because I have a question for Aaron.